With that, we have from Zimbra, uh, Satish Ananand, and they're going to tell us about all this great messaging stuff that they have going. Well, thank you. So Zimbra is a uh, email contact and group calendaring server. Uh, Yay, calendars. This. Yeah, we have group calendaring, and uh, the server runs on uh, Linux and Mac OS X platforms. And we're client agnostic. Uh, we work with Outlook, if that's your preferred client. Uh, we work with both online and offline Outlook, or any of the IMAP or POP clients. Uh, we work with Sunbird. And uh, we also wrote our own web UI. Uh, and it's an Ajax web UI, zero footprint client. Runs on Firefox, uh, and IE, and Safari across all desktops. And we support over-the-air syncing uh, with mobile devices. Uh, where we focused on a uh, an ar architecture where you don't have to install a new client on your mobile device. It'll just sync with your native client on your mobile device. And uh, we support all the open standards protocols like SOAP, REST, RSS, and Atom. And most importantly, it's open source. So uh, Zimbra.com is where uh, people are uh, coming to form the community and uh, there is a forum there where there's a lot of support. Uh, I just started doing these slides there when, uh, when the other gentleman was talking, so I don't have too many slides. What I'll do instead is log on to our remote server and show you a demo, which will uh, give you at least a flavor of what it is and what it can do. Uh, and then I'll give you two slides on what the differentiations are. And then uh, please open it up for questions. We have Anand here, who is uh, the, the architect behind Zimbra, and so I can answer all kinds of questions. Okay. Can email client push or uh, pull? Excuse me, what was the question? Email protocol push or pull? The email protocol push or pull. So uh, it's IMAP and POP and SOAP, Therefore, and there's yes. asynchronous <laughs> notification, right? So, yeah. so right now the Ajax client pulls. So you don't run a call on the NTP packet. What's that? You don't run a file on the NTP packet. Blackberry? You have no push. No. Oh. Oh, no. then we talk to the BlackBerry Enterprise. We talk to the BlackBerry Enterprise server, which then does the push. He's talking about the, the patent dispute that NTP is suing people uh, left and right. That's yes, we're not part of that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to be. We don't have any money, so they can't sue us anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. They'll sue you. They just don't have anything to gain. Yeah. <laughs> So we do nothing with push. All, all, uh, all we do is work with the BlackBerry Enterprise server, and they do the push. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to show you is the Ajax UI because it's no fun showing you an IMAP client or Outlook. Um, so this is the web UI running under Firefox in, uh, on the Mac, obviously. And it's off of uh, our data center. It's, uh, you know, Roadshow is hosted off of Zimbra. So everything you're seeing here is live. A um, few things. Uh, if, let me get my mouse orientation right. These two screens I get confused. A okay. few, uh, few things when I mouse over on people's names, if they are in my address book, you know, I get a business card off their address book. So if I wanted to call Andy, I would just, you know, uh, mouse over on his name, or if I wanted to call Jill and if she's on my address book, I would just mouse over on her name and then pick up the phone and call rather than leave the app and go to the uh, contacts app and look, look for Jill. Uh, other things we have is a developer API uh, called the Zimlet API, which basically allows users, uh, developers to connect external data sources either inside the intranet like Salesforce or CRM or PeopleSoft, or out on the internet like map, stock, weather, um, flight information, into data that's in your calendar, contacts, email. So uh, here are a few examples. Uh, and it automatically, the sender doesn't have to do anything. The system automatically indexes everything. We have an indexed message store. So the system indexes everything. First, it allows you to search any which way you want, which we'll show you next. But it also understands certain patterns. In this, in this particular example, uh, there, there's a URL. And it's understood that that's a URL, and we've written a connector to the Alexa database, and so you get a snapshot of what the URL is. So if you get something in the mail, before you click it, you can make sure that it's a good site before you click it. Uh, this guy wants to meet next Friday. I can mouse over on next Friday and see how my day looks next Friday. Question? When, when 
you're bringing up the, uh, the pop-up on the mouse over at the URL, who is fetching that data and when, if it turns out to be a data set? <coughs> Oh, so you write a module that's a web services call to the Alexa database. The Alexa database basically maps URLs to JPEGs. So, so Alexa pulled it and turned it into a JPEG at some point, and you're getting it asynchronously yes. from Alexa. Correct. It's like the iTunes album cover. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, in this case, uh, we're doing a, a call a Zimlet into our own calendar, so if somebody says next Friday or September 26th, you can see how your day looks then uh, before you answer. So if how you want... You know how to we understand all different kinds of date formats, so that's our indexing engine. As the messages come in, we look for date formats, things like next Friday, you know, tomorrow, today, September 26th, 926th, and we highlight those for you so and link it to your calendar. Language pattern matching. Something like that's that. That's pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so you're busy on next Friday and September 26th, and so you go back to your mini, we have a mini can anchor here, and you can what go to any day and mouse over. And what does it do with the address? We're coming to that in a second. So if you didn't want to do next Friday or September 26th, you could go to any, uh, you could go and uh, go to any date in your calendar and, if there, and see what your calendar looks like. So, you know, you don't have to leave your mail app in order to, when you're composing email or replying about calendars. And so you can then, you know, for instance, you could do right click and create a new appointment from there, or right click from any of these places and do a new appointment. And then this guy says he wants to meet in Seattle, so I can mouse over on that. And that's a Zimlet to a Yahoo Maps API. Again, these are just examples that people are writing in the community <coughs> in order to connect different things into Zimbra. And, uh, other things, uh, this is a connector into a VOAP thing, so uh, that's basically calling Skype, uh, which is pulling up in my screen here, so right there. And so, you know, uh, I can, you know, if there's a phone number, it automatically recognizes that it's a phone number. Currently, this Zimlet only recognizes US phone numbers, but it's just easy to reprogram it to understand phone numbers. And then, you know, uh, we currently connect to Skype, but you know, we've also written connect connectors to the Cisco VoIP switch, and so you, or asterisk, and so you can do you can do things like that. Uh, here's an example inside the intranet. Uh, you know, there is a uh, something like a PO there, and it recognizes an Oracle purchase order, and so it's made a web services. It's all web services. All of these things are web services enabled, so it's made a call to the web services, Oracle web services. Uh, called the Oracle Purchase Order via Web Services, tells you who's requesting, what the description is, and what the cost is, so you don't have to leave your email app to figure out what the purchase order is. Uh, and the other few Zimlets are, you know, you could take this message and drag it into Salesforce and we'll automatically <coughs> add it to the CRM database. There are other examples you can do, our website lists a whole bunch of them, and then we can, uh, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, other things, as I said earlier, we are a fully indexed uh, message store, so you can search for the word Roland cursor and, uh, you know, it'll immediately pull up the message that had the word Roland or cur and cursor. We also index 250 different kinds of attachments and look into them. So, for instance, here I'm going to search for Tolstoy and it's pulled up that and I'm opening that um, message and it's highlighted War and Peace, which is uh, a PDF file in the message, which is where the Tolstoy hit was, and so uh, it's figured out that that's the message filling it out. Uh, for, you know, mostly, many times you want to do a more structured search because now just simple searches are no longer good enough, right? So that now Google has from colon date, colon domain, colon, and all that, all that stuff. We built a visual builder for that kind of stuff so you don't have to, you know, remember all that stuff. So you can say, uh, sorry. You can create a search builder, and you know I'm gonna uh, say I want you know I want to see messages that came from Roland. We're not seeing the from on our screen, but I presume oh, it's there to the left. Sorry, yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, like that. Yeah. There you go. And I can say give me messages from Roland uh, that came before today, and as soon as I do that, it's a continuous search. And I say, give me messages from Roland that came before today, but came after, you know, I'm going back in years here, 
So after September 2002 and today, between September 2002 and today, these are the messages from Roland between those two dates. And uh, I can say, give me only messages from Roland that came between those two dates, but came with a PDF file as an attachment and split it up. Right. And so now I can go back and save the search, and it becomes a virtual folder. Uh, and you know, I, uh, anytime I c click on the virtual folder, it'll bring back the same search. Yes. How large a diverse message store has it been tested with? We've been launched for two months, um, and uh, because it's an open source project, we don't know how many people, are, it's an optional registration, an optional info. We know that over 100,000 mailboxes are in different stages of production or testing. Uh, we know that, you know, uh, we know that 60,000 mailboxes of those, we know about that we're supporting, but you know, after that, and we know that at least another 40,000 exists that we know about, and then we don't know how many other mailboxes exist because it's an open source project. Uh, I, I was referring to the size of data per mailbox. For instance, if I were to transfer just my 2004 and 2005 mm -hmm. Mozilla mail archives into it, it would suddenly be dealing with a unified mail store that was about 40 gig. Um, so I don't know whether it's, it'll deal with 40 gig or not. My my, my personal main box is 2.5 gigs, okay. and it does really fine with what, that. What's the database <coughs> engine? Have, uh, so it's, a, it's the file system. You want to talk about the architecture? So we have three data stores. Um, we use MySQL to see, store message metadata. So when you go list your inbox, all the items that you see there are, come from the database, so we're not opening and parsing a bunch of files. So that data is instant. Um, the actual message messages themselves are stored in flat files on the file system, one per file. And we have uh, Lucene, which is our, which is the tool that we use to index the content of your messages, also stores uh, data in the file system separately. So there are three different data stores back in all of this. How modular is this system? Like, could I, could I use this really cool Ajax GUI on my Curry or IMAP system? Um, can I take the mail that, you know, if I use your guys' mail server for a year and a half and decide I don't want to do this anymore, how much work is it going to be to convert back to Courier? Will I have to manually export all the mail through my client and then import it back again? Yep. Yeah, there are, it's a yeah there, there are a few ways in which you can do this, right? One is we have an IMAP, ex, IMAP migration visit that works both. It's just an IMAP okay, connection. So that is an export yes. of all the mail and that's then an re-import it back through our system. That's right. That's one. We also have REST, so you can do things like, you know, slash user, slash username, slash mailbox.zip, and you'll get a zip file of all your mail, you know, and, and then you have your content with you. Um, so there are a few ways in which you can do that. And we have SOAP APIs and Perl APIs into it, so you can write your own script that sucks things out and puts it in. Is there an import function? Yes, so there is migration tools both from IMAP, um, there's an exchange migration tool, uh, 5.5 and 2000 and 2003, so you can just do that. CSV import from contacts and calendar, so those are the three ways in which you can do it. Yeah. Um, just flat mail files? Just flat mail files? Uh, files. Uh, we definitely have a way to put those in. Is this a um, LAMP technology? You're downloading code, or are you actually providing a service? A service? Like, I'm not sure. Which way you're doing it? Sorry, you're yeah. it, this is not a service. It's uh, you download the server and you run it on your premises. So. Okay, PHP, Perl, Python. No, uh, no. this is all 100% JavaScript on the on the front end, and on the back end, it's all Java. So, running under Tomcat. Tomcat. And MySQL. Yep. Now, this is an, uh, a natural system to start dealing with the. Um, our total failure to make crypto mail systems work. Have you looked into this? That is something we are looking into. Okay. <laughs> we definitely want to do that. It's on our own. So does it have a built-in SMTP server or do it? We use Postfix. So, you, so it has built-in Postfix? Yes. Yeah. And is MySQL embedded or you have to install MySQL? Everything is, yeah. you don't have to do anything outside of that. So okay. it's all self-contained. And, and so what form do you ship it? Is it like an RPM or? Yeah, we have a little wrapper script around the set of RPMs. Okay. So you can take the system and you can do a multi-node install where you have n number of MTAs and like n store servers where you know the IMAP servers are running. So we have like a small wrapper around our install so we can do a multi-node install, but it's RPMs. 
And was this project built from scratch? From your team, or was it uh, yeah, an existing the, open source project? No, it was built from scratch by the company, and we then made it open source two months ago. So uh, when we launched, that's the first time when we we said it's an open source project. Pertinent question: What's your profit model on top of that? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so what we have here is all of the Ajax client and the server is all available in the open source. Um, what what we don't make available in the open source is Outlook Connect. It's the Outlook connector. So if you want to use Outlook with IMAP, that's fine, right? Um, so if you want to use Outlook with Mappy, mm -hmm. online and offline. If you want to use over-the-air sync with mobility. So we built modules around the open source project, and we sell 24 by 7 support. Um, that, that, that's all part of what we call the Zimbra network, which is the Zimbra open source edition. So, so I saw your Web 2.0 presentation, which got many who's in office. And uh, the, when I saw the PO thing, the first thing I thought was, um, I can't think of any PO databases in the world that don't require credentials to do querying against them. Yep. So do you do like credential storing? Absolutely. I mean, is this? Yeah. So there's a there's an authentication in in the Zimlet spec. There is a way in which you can authenticate to third party systems, and okay. uh, there's a handshake that happens. So is that stored in? I mean. In, you don't have anything you know to bounce over it, so. Um, it's up to the plugin, right? It's up to the Zimlet that's been installed. Five minutes. To so it could potentially, <coughs> when you mouse over it, it could pop up and ask you for authentication at that yeah. point. In fact, the Salesforce Zimlet, uh, which does exactly that. When you mouse over it, it pops up and asks for an authentication before you log in. So with Outlook, your Outlook record, which is a, I guess a commercial record, that right. you understand calendaring? Absolutely. Specific to From the end user's perspective, uh, there is no visible change uh, from Outlook, whether they're using it against Exchange or Zimbra. So but it's what, like if, what if one user is on Exchange and they're sending a calendar request to another user who's on Zimbra? We understand the Exchange format, so you can do uh, cross-platform uh, scheduling. And you could do, we do the union of two gals, so if you have Active Directory, we can authenticate against it, so we can authenticate against Windows domain. We ship with OpenLDAP, so if you don't want Active Directory, we can do that. Or if you want both, we can take the union of the two and when we do the gap. I assume you can authenticate against an existing LF server too. Absolutely, yeah. So real quickly, since we have only five more minutes, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop the search. You can search by you know domains, so you can look at all the domains that have sent you emails. So for instance, you know you're, 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 you can say, I want all mails from Princeton, and, and give that. You can see domains that sent you mail versus you sent mail to. I'm going to cut over to the calendar since we're running out of time here. Um, we have full-on group scheduling calendar. We really believe that you know this is the most standards compliant calendar out there. There's RSS in and RSS out. You can subscribe to anything in iCalShare.com, right? Uh, you can share your calendar. You can do read access, write access inside your domain, outside of your domain. So in this particular case, I'm looking at my calendar. I can. Jim has given me permission to look at his calendar. I have put his calendar in green. Uh, Ted has given me permission to look at his calendar, I put his calendar in uh, in pink, and maybe we'll pick John, and his calendar is in gray. And you see how you know I can see overlays of all the calendars if they have given me permission. And if I want to schedule a meeting, there's something called a schedule thermometer, so which gives you the level of conflict on each day. So uh, I can pick a date and see how the different calendars look on that date. And the darker this. Uh, this cell is, in this case, it's saying it's light pink because only one calendar is, uh, is conflicting that week. But like here, uh, what we see in that cell is three calendars are conflicted. That cell, uh, three calendars are conflicted, but that cell, only two calendars are conflicted. So it's, it's lighter shade. So you can pick days in which it gives you visual indication of the conflict level. Um, so you can, uh, you can easily schedule. We also have free busy scheduling and, and things like that. As I said, we have ways in which you can get in RSS feeds. Finally, the next thing that's coming around is IAM. So, you know, uh, I can just get IAM. I can, you know, uh, or if I wanted to add this guy to this chat, I can just drag him and drop him onto this chat. And, um, you know, <coughs> I can say, Like that, and you know all the zimlets that you install will work, you know, in your IAM as well. So if you're saying things like you know meet me next Friday, you know, all that will still work. And then you can be in your IAM session. You can you can mouse over next Friday, see how your day looks, and then right click 
and create a new appointment from within your IAM without ever having to leave oh, new your, your chat and then go. I have a question. All right. We're out of time, so I'm going to, yeah, questions. Uh, if um, sure. Um, let's have a couple of questions taken while JS comes up here and uh, gets his machine set up. All right. Can you notify over email and SMS?